Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone from Helsinki and welcome to this wider webinar. My name is Rachel Giselquist. I'm a senior research fellow here and I'm very, very pleased to chair this session. Uh, today our fo focus is the Afrobarometer, which is a pan-African nonpartisan survey research network that provides data on African experiences and evaluations of democracy, governance and quality of life. Um, at, at UNU Wider, we've used Afrobarometer data in several of our projects. I've used it in several of my projects, and we're really delighted to be joined uh, today by Professor Emmanuel Jimaboadi and Dr. Joseph Asunka. They will introduce the Afrobarometer project's origins, its achievements, discuss the change that it has contributed to governance in Africa, and they will also introduce the newly developed SDG Sustainable Development Goals scorecards. Uh, Professor uh, Jima Boadi is co-founder and board chair of the Afrobarometer. He is also co-founder co and former executive director of the Ghana Center for Democratic Development, a leading independent democracy and good governance think tank in Accra. He is a former professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Ghana and has held various other faculty and research positions uh, in the United States as well. In honor of his contributions to research and policy, he has received among other honors, the Distinguished Africanist of the Year uh, from the African Studies Association, the Martin Luther King Jr. Award for Peace and Social Justice, and the Republic of Ghana's highest national award, the Order of Volta. Dr. Joseph Asunka is the current CEO of Afrobarometer. Uh, he was previously program officer in the Global Development and Population Program at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and a lecturer in political science at the University of California, Los Angeles. He also has a long relationship with the Afrobarometer he served uh, as a data manager for the Afrobarometer before his PhD studies at, at UCLA. And he works his own research and his publications are uh, focused in particular in the areas of distributive politics, elections and electoral processes uh, and migration. Um, before I move on to the, the presentation, uh, just a, a bit of, um, um, background on, on how things will work today. So our speakers will present for about 30, 35 minutes or so, and then we will open the floor for questions. Uh, so please do think about questions you would like to ask our speakers as they, as they give their presentations. During the presentations, you should feel free to put questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And then as time permits, we will get to as many of these questions as we can. And I will, if time permits, unmute a few of you to ask your questions live. Um, so without further ado, let me um, move on to our speakers. I think the first speaker will be Professor uh, Jim Abouadi. Please, Professor. Thank you, Rachel, for the introduction. And thank you, UN Wider, for the opportunity to uh, present to you um, information about the Afrobarometer and why, uh, in our view, it's an indispensable resource for effective research and policy making on Africa and on African societies and peoples. Here is the context for the for the founding of the Afrobarometer. Um, so scholars of political behavior and uh, social phenomena have scrutinized virtually every aspect of the opinions of American and European voters, and to a, a lesser extent, those of Latin America. And yet, until recently, and for all kinds of reasons, virtually nothing was known about the values, preferences, knowledge, or interest of the mass of the of humanity living in Africa. Instead, elites, experts, so-called experts, 
media pundits, opinion leaders, and especially politicians purported to know what ordinary Africans think and feel. And these views and opinions will often be pre presented as if they are the views of and preferences of ordinary Africans. Well, what harm was done by this? One way to, uh, to appreciate the harm that was done by all of this was that by 1989, when the Berlin Wall fell, very few of us, if any, seem to be aware of the fact that the African continent stood on the verge of breaking its authoritarian chains and embarking on a wide range of democratic experiments. Well, we are happy and proud to say today that the Afrobarometer has helped to change this situation and we've done so with almost no drama. So this is really the introduction, uh, the grand introduction to the Afrobarometer. You know, that uh, in conventional wisdom for the most part held that uh, it's a continent whose uh, people are impoverished and um, hard pressed in their lives. And so they wouldn't care much about democracy or human rights. But what has happened in Africa since 1989 or since the 90s, and especially what the Afrobarometer has helped us to know about African attitudes has helped to change that. So what's the Afrobarometer? is the premier Pan-African organization dedicated to tracking the experiences, evaluations, and perspectives of ordinary African citizens on political, economic, and social development in their respective countries, and especially injecting these findings into policy processes at the national, continental, and global levels. We have been amplifying or we have helped to amplify the voices of ordinary Africans in the over 20 years or so we've been on the scene. And the Afrobarometer, we are proud to say, is now African-owned and African-managed, and it's done so with adherence to maximum scientific research standards and methodology. We cover much of Africa. Rep we, our coverage represents roughly 70 to 80% of the African population. Um, interviewed in eight rounds of surveys so far, uh, beginning from 1999. We've done, in fact, a total of 29, uh, 219 surveys uh, in 39 countries. Not only have we done that and published many of much of some of our findings in thousands of and hundreds of publications and books and so on, um, we have helped to build the capacity of a young generation of Africans to undertake this type of research, analyze this type of data, and to share those findings with at least nas their national audiences with their national governance and democracy stakeholders. And um, happily, we the Afrobarometer so far is a public good. All our data is published on the Afrobarometer website, and this is complemented by a free online data analysis tool. I'm also happy to share with you the outcome of an organization organizational and institutional development process we embarked on some three, four years ago, which has enabled us to move from an organic network, network to a viable African institution. This process resulted in the incorporation of the Afrobarometer as an independent corporate legal entity based in Accra. It also has come with the constitution of a board of directors of the Afrobarometer to oversee our corporate governance. And uh, I, I am 
proud and honored to be the chair of the Afrobarometer. Uh, some of whose, whose members, board members, are projected on the screen. Um, two co other co founders of the Afrobarometer, Professor Michael Bratton and Professor Mattis. And then three entirely new comments to the Afrobarometer. Uh, Amar, Amar Medani, who is a social development specialist with the UN in Geneva. Uh, Amina Oyagola, who is a retired uh, MTN corporate uh, executive and uh, also a gen women's leadership um, and entrepreneurship, uh, promoting uh, a person in their own private capacity. And then Mrs. Lara Taylor Pierce, who uh, is the Auditor General of uh, Sierra Leone. We've also incorporated an International Advisory Council uh, that provides high level strategic intel to the Afrobarometer and helps us to link to policy actors and prospective funders. And um, we will just a uh, short project for you some of the, the members of the International Advisory Council of the Afrobarometer, which is chaired by distinguished US diplomat, former US Assistant Secretary of State for Africa, Johnny Carson, and whose members include uh, pre former president of Liberia, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, uh, is Zena Badawi, current chair of SOAS, and uh, international broadcaster that needs no introduction. Um, it has uh, Professor Jega, of, um, the, formerly the head of the uh, Election Commission of Nigeria. Um, it has Dr. William Mutunga, former Chief Justice of Kenya, and, and many others, as you can see there. And uh, Dr. Vera Songwe is on as uh, an observer and a counselor. We are particularly proud of the fact that, and I speak for myself as well, I believe for my colleagues, that um, the founding leadership of the Afrobarometer has transferred power and authority to a new crop of leaders, more dynamic, more younger, more imaginative, to take the Afrobarometer forward from its 20th year into its third decade and beyond. And this is the group uh, which is now ably headed by Dr. Joseph Asunka as our Chief Executive Officer and from whom you will be, uh, from whose own mark you'll be hearing uh, us a presentation shortly. I'm also happy to say that the Afrobarometer has emerged from a severe funding crisis it met in 2016 to a much, much improved financial viability, one that has been anchored by Cedar Sweden, USA, the Mo Ibrahim Foundation, Hewlett Foundation, and the European Societies Foundation and African Regional Office. And happy to say also that just this year and reflecting the fact that the Afrobarometer's financial situation, at least in the short term and uh, to some extent in the medium term is looking better and better. We've received for the first time funding from the European Union and then MasterCard Foundation, Gates Foundation, uh, and then the Gates Foundation and the World Bank have returned to the pool, the pool of Afrobarometer funders. But this is all also to advertise that we are we still far from the kind of achieving the financial viability, uh, especially for the medium and especially long-term of the Afrobarometer, which happens to be one of the key goals and objectives of the new CEO. And I hope we can count on all of you to help him to meet that goal. So just uh, to incidentally to talk about the priorities uh, of the new CEO, uh, is to basically position the Afrobarometer to play a far more prominent role in, in sub-regional and regional policy making and related processes than it has done to date, it's been able to do to date. And also 
for the Afro Biometer to build and grow a rapid response infrastructure so that we can share and analyze the Afro Biometer data in real time and uh, to, to contribute to policy debates, policy issues. So, and uh, the SDG uh, tracker we have developed is an example of what we intend to do and why we are happy to share that with you. And then also uh, the plan is to exponentially strengthen capacity in conducting research and analysis of the Afrobiometer type first among our staff and network, but also among African uh, universities and research institutions, and hopefully other Africa policy relevant institutions on the continent whose own staff can use some understanding and appreciation of how to use data in their analysis and in their in development of their programs. And, okay, so. So now let me talk about a little about Afrobarometer as a great resource for effective policy making. So long as you are making policy that relates to Africans or that are meant for Africa. So we say, if you're a policymaker, you must want to know what the people think and want. And if you are that kind of policymaker, then you must tend to the Afrobarometer because the Afrobarometer, Afrobarometer data provides independent reality check on official reports and claims. So for instance, the Afrobarometer Lake Poverty Index measures citizens' experience of deprivation of basic necessities, regardless of macroeconomic indicators. It measures quality instead of mere presence or quantity or even inputs. It measures outputs as felt by people. And uh, it measures, it helps to understand citizens' priority because one of our standard questions on all the surveys is to ask, in your opinion, what are the most important problems facing this country that government should address? Sorry. So, and then we also provide data that can help a policymaker that's an African policymaker, an Africa related policymaker, scope the kinds of problems and challenges that are on hand. So, for example, it helps to know that on migration, one in three Africans say they have considered emigration, including half of young adults on the average, many of whom are highly educated and so on. And it helps to know that many of them are simply looking for jobs or a way out of poverty and that they have their eyes more on other African countries than on Europe or on North America. Or for climate change, it helps to know that most farmers in Tanzania may not have heard of climate change and that if you are going to be able to uh, address this challenge, the challenge of climate change in Tanzania, and you want public support for it, then you want to increase climate change awareness among your citizens. Again, the Afrobarometer data is easily disaggregatable by country, region, gender, urban, rural location, education, age group, party affiliation, and so, and in this way, Afrobarometer data enables you to better target your interventions. Then also, it helps, the data helps to secure a sound footing for action and for intervention. So for instance, Three-fourths of Africans say they, they support presidential term limits, including countries that don't even have term limit provisions in their constitution. So if you want to do advocacy with the country or di have dialogue with the country's government, as European Union, as Finland, 
as um, as G7 country, G8, G20, Alpha Biometer data can help your cause. Now, <clears throat> it's also uh, flattering for us to know that Alpha Biometer data is used in global governance indicators all over, including the Ibrahim Index, Economist Intelligence Unit, UNDP, World Bank, USA, Transparency International, and others. And very soon, as I, we advertise, we'll be sharing with you the Alpha Biometers uh, SDG scorecard for tracking progress towards 12 of the 17 SDGs. Then also, there are many instances of Afro Biometer in action. So in Sierra Leone, for instance, uh, the government cited Afrobarometer findings in 2016 as the impetus for, for uh, embarking on uh, a, a program to, to address corruption in that country uh, more systematically and to launch a program called No Bribe <coughs> Citing AD Data. Then again, um, in 2019, the High Court of Botswana cited upper data on tolerance in Bot as, an, as evidence of the country's readiness to embrace and tolerate homosexuality. I must say that um, this same finding uh, in some countries, some of the same findings on homophobic attitudes have also been used by, uh, by uh, bigots to promote LGBT uh, harassment and attack and even legislation. So, uh, you know, this is data, we can cut both ways. And more recently, um, after biometer data has provided great insights in why the public of Guinea supported the coup uh, welcome the coup makers in their country, but also it does point out that Guineans nonetheless consistently reject military rule. So welcoming the military intervention doesn't mean they want the, the military to stay on uh, beyond their welcome. So what are some of the challenges that we face? Challenge number one, not surprised to any of you is the challenge of natural disasters which we can predict which we cannot we, we can only uh, try to live with and manage as best as we could so a uh, typical a typical example is covid 19 which compelled us to suspend round eight field work for seven whole months in 2020 and therefore delayed the completion of our covid uh, of our round eight service even then, as a probiometer, we made lemonade out of lemons and uh, we used, we took it as an opportunity and an invitation uh, to develop a special COVID module capturing the pandemic's impact on citizens and their evaluations of government responses to the pandemic, which we'll be sharing as part of the uh, round eight cross continental data releases. Um, we also use the opportunity to improve our system for working remotely and um, to pilot cell phone surveys and so on. Another challenge we frequently face is the challenge of conducting surveys in autocratic, post-authoritarian and post-conflict societies where respondents tend to be suspicious of interviewer motives and sometimes view the respond the, the interviewers as government agents, uh, where there is a tendency for respondents to be guarded in their responses to politically sensitive questions for fear of negative reprisals, and where we always have to put in place extraordinary safety and security um, precautions for our national partners and for our field workers. Another problem we face is that the African population is still largely semi-literate, increasingly 
uh, semi-literate more than illiterate, but still not sufficiently you know, competent in the ability to conduct uh, self-administered, self, you know, we cannot conduct self-administered service online or by pen or by paper uh, because of the kind of the population that we, 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 we deal with. And there is a tendency for uh, these our respondents to be suspicious of strangers who can to interview them because even today, it is still a relatively new experience for many of our respondents. And there the, as usual, a lot of challenges in understanding the questions, especially skill questions that require them to sort of give a scale of responses, uh, how much, you know, what roughly how much, uh, how deeply, how badly, the, those kinds of things. The other challenge is the, the challenge of data use. First, there is a tendency for, uh, for people and especially politicians and policymakers to resist and to not to, to reject public attitude data, especially when they deem the findings as unflattering or politically unfavorable. And so just to give you an example, uh, when the former president of the deposed president of Guinea was presented with the findings from the uh, Guinea Afrobarometer round seven survey showing that 80% of, of, his, of, his, of adults in his country supported term limits. He said, you know, that was all a fabrication. Then also very often we've, we face uh, questions about methodology, often from people who, that, who really have, um, they speak more from a position of ignorance than from knowledge, but somehow uh, they tend to seize on methodologies. So they ask, for instance, how can you uh, sample the views of 1,200 people in the whole country and claim that they represent the whole country? Uh, we, we run into those questions just about in every country and with different segments of the population and our stakeholders. And <clears throat> there is frequent <clears throat> and baseless accusations of bias and then frequent challenges of communicating the findings in ways that help stakeholders to utilize the findings. And uh, <clears throat> unlike the North American media, the European media, and even Asian media, African news media and civil society generally uh, doesn't have enough capacity in competent use of data. And that's one of the things that our capacity building is aimed to tackle going forward. <clears throat> and then finally, as always, there is the big elephant in the room funding. As I have hinted, Afrobarometer service and related activities have been fortunately supported by a consortium of donors um, led by CEDA Sweden, um, then USA, DFID at some point, the World Bank and some philanthropic foundations. But it's also the case that changing donor priorities, especially G7 aid agencies have constituted, you know, these agencies that have constituted our core donors are often unable to or drop out of funding for us because of um, because of changes in their government priorities and in general the emphasis on democracy and governance issues. And um, so to address all of this, we tried <clears throat> we are trying to professionalize our resource mobilization staff and hope that we and then our, C, our new CEO, as I indicated, is committed to moving the Afrobarometer from, uh, as it were, hand to mouth to more long term sustainable financial sustainability. So, this is where we end, and maybe now you get the substance of what Afrobarometer can offer from Dr. Asunka. Thank you. All right, thank, thank you. So much, Jim. This has been super helpful. So, what I'm now going to present is just an example of the types of ways that we have used the Afrobarometer data to 
provide some reality check on government and data that governments provide. And Ojima has alluded to the fact that it's one thing having infrastructure and other um, programs up and running, but it's another thing people's actual experience of it. And so the SDG scorecards that we develop are supposed to provide that reality check that when governments report about progress in different areas, we have some way of checking to see whether people, ordinary people have actually felt the kind of progress that we hope it would. And so in general, I mean, these sustainable development goals are meant mainly to help drive the, the drivers towards a world of better you know, living conditions, improved incomes, and improved livelihoods in general. And what the Afrobarometer does is to then pull our data together on the experiences of people on the various topics or the various areas that the SDG tries to touch and develop indicators to provide some reality check on what governments actually report. And as Jim noted earlier, we do have data that we can track up to 12 of the 17 um, SDGs. And these are the 12 that we are able to track that is now on your screen. And then just to give you um, a brief description of how the indicators are developed. First of all, of course, Governance and democracy is our signature topic. Afrobarometer started in 1999. That has been our signature topic to date. And SDG 16, which is on peace, justice, and strong institutions, is at the core of the Afrobarometer. Um, uh, uh, yeah, at the core of the Afrobarometer project itself. And how do we then develop our indicators? If you look at each SDG score, I mean SDG goal there are target indicators. And for each of these target indicators, what Afrobarometer does is to look at our, our questions and see which of the questions actually speak to the specific target that the SDG is trying to track. So for example, on SDG 16, the target in, or the indicators are to significantly reduce all forms of violence related to, and death rates everywhere. And that is a, the key indicator under SDG 16. And what we do is to pull from the Afrobarometer questions that talk, touch on tolerance for political violence, violence against women and children, fear of or experience of violence and the like. And we pull these together to construct an index that tracks you know, the progress towards reducing all forms of violence against um, in the, uh, around the globe. Secondly, of course, if you look at areas of promoting rule of law, so for example, in terms of rule of law, the, the key indicator of course is promoting rule of law at the national, international, and ensure that it, there's equal access to justice. And in the Afrobarometer, we do have a lot of indicators that touch on this. So experience of crime, reporting crime, trust in the police, trust in the courts. And we pull all these indicators together to develop an indicator that tracks that. So for each country, what we try to do is to make sure that we pull all of these indicators and then develop um, the questions that are relevant to each indicator in the SDG and develop a measure to track it. Here are some of the other examples that we track in the Afrobarometer, apart from the SDG 16, which is at the core of our project. We do have questions about poverty and hunger, which we capture. We have quality of education, we have good health and the like, and so on. And the list goes on. So for each of these, if you read the Afrobarometer um, SDGs on our website, you will see the specific indicators or questions from the Afrobarometer that we use to track the particular indicator. All right, so now I'm going to give you just an example of how the SDG scorecards are developed. And I'll put this in two perspectives, one at the country level and then a continental picture of each of the sustainable development goals. So if you look here, first of all, on the left panel, we have I'm giving you an example from Botswana. So for no poverty, we have what we call the lift poverty index in the Afrobarometer, which is a combination of people having had access or gone without certain basic necessities, food, water, um, like, you know, different uh, income, cash income and the like. And what we do is pull this together and try to track, track over time. And this is a trend over time for Botswana where people who have experienced moderate or high lived poverty 
re actually reduced from about 47% to the recently 2021 about 37%. And so that re represents a remarkable reduction, a significant reduction. And if you look at our sample sizes, our margin of error is plus or minus three. So whenever a country is able to record a reduction or an improvement by plus or minus three percentage points, we consider that a significant change. Anything less than that is considered not significant. And so in the case of Botswana, above poverty and then of course zero hunger, we've seen a significant reduction. And then what we try to do is then to put this in a traffic light indicator system where we have green for when the country is, has actually made a significant improvement as the change is more than plus or minus three percentage points or when they are just within the margin of error, then we use the yellow to mean that there has not been any change. It's not, there's no deterioration and there's no progress. We leave it as yellow. And where the country has actually gone backward, then we put that as red. If a country is actually meeting the SDG targets as stipulated in the Sustainable Development Goals, then that becomes blue. And so red is bad, yellow is no change, green is progress, and of course, blue is actually meeting the target. So if you look at the case of Botswana, yes, reducing poverty uh, is an improvement. Zero hunger, we have seen no change because the change is not more than um, plus three percentage point. That's why it is yellow. In, the, in terms of um, reducing the frequency of going without medical supply or medical care, you see here it is a red dot. And that also tells us that Botswana actually retrogressed on this particular indicator. So this gives you a picture of the case of Botswana. So if you take each country, you will see the detailed analysis on the left panel. And then on the right panel, we have the traffic light situation. Here, of course, now this is the continental view. What we now try to do is we pull all the countries that we have tracked together and average them across the various indicators and then see what is the performance in each country. So for the case of no poverty or ending poverty, we see Botswana and Burkina Faso recorded improvement that is in the green. We've seen here that Gabon and Ghana made no progress and those two are in yellow. And then most countries actually retrogress in this indicator. And so we see that by and large in terms of reducing poverty, if you look at the continental picture, there is a general reduction or at least a retrogression across most of the countries that we've today. But I must make a point here, uh, okay, just a clarify a point here that these indicators are not meant to compare countries to one another. It is only to compare countries against themselves over time. So what is the progress of Botswana in terms of poverty reduction between 2015 and date? It is not possible to compare Botswana to Togo because they indicator is just showing whether or not the countries have made progress in one direction against itself over time and not necessarily comparing countries across um, the continent. And so for no poverty, yes, there's a general reduction when it comes to zero hunger, which we also use our question on hunger. We've seen a few countries have greens. There are some yellows that shows that there's no significant change. And then here too, we have quite a number of countries that have made have actually retrogressed over the last five years. And then, of course, SDG 5, which is about gender equality in terms of both access to technology and then also financial decision making. So the left side is about access to technology and the right side is about you know, financial decision making in the household. I think the good news, if you look at this picture, is that overall, Financial decision making has improved quite a bit over time because we see a number of greens here compared to when you look at access to and use of technology. What I want to emphasize in this in this particular um, case is just to note that when we have half a circle, some of them are half filled in. The half filled in just means that there's a mixed performance. And so, for example, if education improves overall in the country, 
but then the improvement among women is much lower than that of men, then we give a half cycle because it is it's not a collective, a, a general improvement. There's improvement, but then they, in terms of demographics, there's a differential. And so whenever you see a half cycle, that is what it means. We have more, multiple indicators and some of the indicators are trending in the opposite direction. And that is what leads to have the uh, to us having the half indicator. But of course, the index is there to guide people's uh, uh, interpretation. Of course, when it comes to decent work and economic growth, and also we have two separate indicators. And here, to by and large, we've seen that there's a general retrogression across the the the, the continent. And then. Right, so peace and justice, this is as a society, our signature topic. And then of course, a topic of interest all over in terms of democracy and the promotion of democracy across the world. Everybody's worried about the retrogression. People talk about democracy going, I mean, there's a lot of retrogression in democracy, uh, democratic processes. And we can actually see it quite a bit here that for most countries, when it comes to promoting, I mean, democratic, development and strong democratic institutions from the citizen perspective we have seen a retrogression by and large in most countries all right so all of this to just give you a a, a flavor of the kinds of things that the afrobiometric can do and the what how we can use the data to provide reality check and the main purpose of this SDG scorecards is let's provide a reality check on what governments report and see whether there's consistency on what governments say that they are making progress on and whether or not people are actually feeling it on the ground. And I think having both side by side allows us to get to a point where we can see, hey, are we really making progress? Because as we all know, trickle down economics does not just work as smoothly as we would hope. And so sometimes there are bottlenecks to how people actually feel some of the implement the intervention that government put in place. And so we do have this to provide that reality check. So I'll stop here and thank you so much for your attention and we're happy to take your questions. Thanks very much. Um, I see there's already a few questions and I would invite the audience to keep sending questions in as well. But uh, I wanted to kick off with, with a question of my own as chair. Um, so I've been following, I, I know that uh, there's been a series in the Washington Post in the uh, monkey cage uh, section um, looking at the Afrobarometer. And, and I think you, you both have a jointly authored uh, article um, discussing the results of the, the Afrobarometer and, and discussing how we see, I think, a, a democratic disappointment gap uh, across the data. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a bit about that, and but also um, I wonder how you see that um, democratic disappointment gap intersecting with, with the current COVID situation. Do you see it worsening? Uh, what does the latest data suggest? So, of course, the point we try to make in that piece and um, in many of the pieces we've done on, um, on African aspirations for democratic governance and accountable governance is to make a distinction between uh, demand and supply and also to also try to uh, point out how the African story with respect to democratization and um, preference for democracy may be different from the story emerging from other regions of the world with respect to the desire, with respect to the support, with respect to the demand for democracy. In terms of, but we of course present a very broad, you know, big brush picture of the of the situation, there are interesting country variations, and we note, for instance, that um, in the latest round of the Africa, in the round A survey for a country like South Africa, uh, support for democracy had significantly declined and was no more a majority opinion. At the same time, um, you you. You take off what's going on in Ethiopia, 
and uh, you look at the latest Afrobarometer findings on Ethiopia, well, Ethiopians overwhelmingly support democracy, notwithstanding the trauma that the country is going through right now. Mm -hmm. And just to add briefly that in terms of the COVID-19, when we, the, the fortunate thing is we had completed about 16 of the countries before the lockdowns. And after the lockdown, we went back to the field and Jim alluded to this, that we had a COVID-19 module. But then the countries, if you compare the countries that were before the COVID lockdown and after the COVID lockdown, support for democracy and the commitment to democratic norms are indistinguishable. It's still at the same level and so we haven't yet seen or at least it was probably it's probably too early to have seen it the next round of the surveys we have the full COVID-19 module again and would we'll have some results to then compare see whether or not there has been any influence but as at this point we don't we haven't seen that the data mm -hmm. thanks um I have more questions, but I will ask the questions from the chat. I've been trying to get a couple of the audience members to unmute, but it hasn't worked. So I'm going to ask a couple of the questions here that are related to maybe more technical questions, but I think um, uh, I think they also touch on some, some bigger issues as well. Uh, so the first question um, is from Ivan Manike, and it uh, says, greetings. Um, the data are really interesting, and um, I know he has used the data in his work. It's a great resource. And the question is, have you ever had an evaluation of the indicators, uh, which are generally subjective with other existing more objective indicators? Uh, what thoughts do you have on that? For example, a comparison between the lived poverty index and other existing poverty measures. I, sh I, sh I should have an answer to this, but I don't, I know we've done some with, on the political findings, we've done uh, comparisons with the Freedom House and, and other findings on the, and then, you know, it's because um, our data sometimes sits side by side with the Mo Ibrahim um, indexes, uh, governance indexes, uh, indicators on some of those issues uh, there are there, there are there are discrepancies but my view is that or my my personal position is that you know data is a, not you know truth is a very complicated matter and so it you approach truth from a variety of angles so if government says we have as you know we spend so much on education or on health. And citizens say, well, we, um, we still uh, didn't get medical care when we needed one. I mean, a, 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 a segment of the population says, so that is their, their reality. And it's got to be matched against, uh, against uh, what other people say. I think the value and the importance of the Afrobarometer lies in the fact that we do have over time data on the same set of indicators. So if somebody said, I went without food many times in the previous year, in round six, and then in round seven, the person says a few times, that represents an objective imp improvement in that person's situation, regardless of what government statistics or World Bank or anybody's statistics say. So there is a sense in which the Afrobarometer data can be accepted on its own terms, provided it meets the technical quality of the criterion of scientific and objective tracking or study of things. Mm -hmm. And just to add briefly to that, I think um, this example of situations where you would say a massive supply of say electricity in a country. And so there's a lot of connectivity visually, mm -hmm. but then if you look at how much electricity or how long people actually access electricity, the quality of the electricity supply and stability of it is non-existent. And so if you want to take the objective measure of the supply of electricity and just looking at how much the distribution looks like on the ground, 
and not take into account how people actually experience the supply of electricity, then you're missing something. So you have the objective measure of we've covered 90% of the country with supply, but how much of it is actually translated into something that people benefit from? And that's a gap that the Afrobarometer actually feels. And so you may compare the objective and the subjective assessment, and you see a big gap. But the big gap is just because people don't experience it the way you see it objectively on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, I, there's another uh, couple of questions here from Rukiatu Nikiema. Um, I'll just ask one of them, given the time, uh, which speaks a bit to the, the, what we've been talking about. And she asks, uh, why don't you consider including uh, other quantitative data, for example, data on revenue or consumption. Um, so I wonder, uh, well, if you could speak to that, but also perhaps um, maybe bring in some of the other research that's been done using the Afrobarometer data that, that might you know, bring together, that I know brings together different types of data. I'll, 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 Joseph, I hope you can uh, take up. <laughs> The first question, because you you are first you 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 were an economist before you became a political scientist. I, I my, econ, my economics didn't go beyond high school. Right, um, Rachel, can you repeat that? I think I lost you briefly. Uh, yeah, so it's a question asking about other types of data, and uh, you know, wondering if you could bring in, for instance, data on revenue or on consumption in in the Afrobarometer. Um, but I wonder if you could also maybe speak for, more broadly to using the Afrobarometer along with other types of, of data to examine uh, other questions. Right, and I think quite a number of people have done that by pulling together data from other sources and then using the Afrobarometer as a complement or supplement to do like, those kinds of analysis. So whether it is in terms of revenues, uh, government spending, budgets and budget openness, because for example, we have asked questions from time to time about people's access to local budgets and then how do you use that as and draw on data like say, the, you know, the world's um, surveys on budget openness or the budget openness index in different countries. And so we can look at some kinds of transparency measures. And of course, Jim alluded to this, whether it's a Freedom House or other transparency. I think it always brings a richness to the analysis that you're providing some, an analysis that pools on both the Afrobarometer that provides this subjective assessments and sometimes clearly objective assessments of people's experiences vis-a-vis -vis data that exists somewhere that could be used to inform whether it is policy or even an academic piece that you're writing. And I think that combination has been done several. Several people have done that and it's, it's not it's not impossible to do. We have done that in several of our publications as well. Mm -hmm. There's moving in another direction. There's a, um, another question here from James that uh, speaks to sort of, it's a more challenging question about the ideological leanings of the, the Afrobarometer. Um, so, uh, um, uh, he asks, um, uh, Professor Jima praises countries that have used the, the data to make pro-LGBTQ laws um, while criticizing those who've used the Afrobarometer surveys to legislate uh, against LGBTQ. Um, does this, do such descriptions uh, and positions create more suspicion about the, the real intentions of the Afrobarometer? So I wonder if you could speak about that and, and you know, maybe bring in some of your experiences with, with reactions, perhaps from different countries to the, the results and the, the framing of the, the questions. So, so these are two, there are two separate questions here and both of them are really compelling questions. The first one is, um, does the Afrobarometer have an ideological bias? Well, I believe we do. I believe we do in the sense that, of course, we share uh, values that are uh, principles that are contained in the UN declaration of UN declarations and other commitments that the whole world is, is, uh, is, is taking, even if 
uh, not in compliance. So yes, there is, there is some ideological bias. I mean, we do this survey, we ask so many, we have a lot of questions. In some, on, at, at least a couple of occasions, or maybe at least one occasion, we ask people whether they thought, um, whether it was okay for a man to beat his wife or to beat his spouse. Well, their responses may well be, uh, in some places we get overwhelming uh, majority support for white beating. I do not shy away from describing this as primitive. It's ideological bias, but I'd rather be more honest about it than to beat about it, you know, just uh, sit on the fence on that. So again, uh, on LGBT issues, I agree that I was speaking in my activist mode because I'm in Ghana currently, there is a raging uh, debate because there's a parliamentary, uh, there's a bill before parliament which carries provisions such as imprisoning LGBTQs uh, on some big criteria, um, giving double their sentence to those who advocate or support or try to defend them, and uh, even more punishment for knowing and not reporting, knowing about somebody. Who, so I cannot, you, you know, it's hard for me to find a better vocabulary, but I understand this, on, on this occasion, I was in my activist mode. I normally talk more diplomatically than that, but uh, this is a situation where I just could not master my normal discipline about these things. So James, sorry about that, but I also want to be honest about it. And, and then on, on the democracy and democratic governance questions. So we challenge ourselves. We ask ourselves constantly, do people really mean and understand it when they say they support democracy? And one of the ways we tested this is to ask the question, by the meaning of democracy in different ways and to put it, put a question in the form of vignettes. So we give people a choice. In country A, elect, you know, leaders are chosen periodically through elections, the judiciary is in, independent from the executive, uh, laws are made by parliament uh, versus then country B. Which one is democratic? And the oh, majority of Africans, 70% in the last, the last time we checked, defined democracy correctly, meaning that there is some <clears throat> basic understanding of democracy as essentially a political governance idea. Then we've also been tracking, we've been asking people this binary question. A government <clears throat> that is accountable, even if it is slow or not so great on the delivery side, versus a government that is strong on the delivery side, but not accountable. And increasingly, we get majorities voting for accountable, even if not so effective government. When we started asking that question, <clears throat> the average, the African average was about 52%. The last time we asked the question last in round eight, <clears throat> it was 62% a 10 percentage increase in about uh, 10 years. That seems to me to confirm the story and the picture we are picking up of growing and hardening commitment to democratic governance ideals as opposed to the other way around. <clears throat> Joe, would you like to come in as well? Right, I think Jima has covered it now effectively in, the, in, this, in this particular case. So, and as, as Jima mentioned, yes, we, we are both in this activist mode and sometimes <laughs> our activism gets in the way, but certainly as researchers, we, we do speak to the data and we speak to our results without being emotionally charged, but it's a particular time of the, the year that we are so charged about the situation that is so hard to resist. So James, again, sorry. <laughs> well, I, um, 
Unfortunately, our time is is coming to an end, so I need to close the conversation. But I think it's a nice place to end with a with a challenging question and a, a good response, a good defense. Um, so, uh, you know, the Afrobarometer has really been it is a great resource for research. But I I think as you've shown shown really well for us today, also for policy, both for for country governments, but also for for international organizations. Um, uh, for those not familiar with it, please look it up, and uh, the rest of us will just will keep working with your with your data. And um, it's it's nice also to learn more about the SDG scorecards, which I think add a really interesting dimension to the discussion about progress toward the SDGs, toward meeting the SDGs. So thank you, gentlemen. Um, thank you. Much too. appreciated for joining us today. Right. Thank you all. And of course, on behalf of the Afro Barometer, I really want to extend our appreciation and the opportunity given us to, to share these results. And we are always happy to respond to any queries or common questions that people will have, or even how to access and use our data. We, we have people who can support that. So please feel free to reach out if you need to. Great. Bye-bye. All right. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye then. Thank you so much.